back in the day, you know, Rich said, I could post my rules on the front page of the New York Times and no one would follow them. And I think back then he meant, it's, they're too hard to do. You're buying the highs, selling the lows, taking small losses. Profits turn into losses, big profits turn into small profits. Now, it's, it means something different in my mind. It means if you tell me your rules, I'll tell you where you're wrong. <laughs> so you may have been around for 40 years, dude, but I don't think you're right. And so this is what I hear <laughs> almost all the time from Twitter and from people I, in, in spaces and on podcasts is that, no, you're wrong. Welcome to the Algorithmic Advantage. We're here to expand the toolkit of the quant trading community and introduce investors to the many advantages of systematic trading. Our goal is to educate and inspire as we embark on a captivating journey into the vast knowledge and experience of leading portfolio managers and other experts in the field. We hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, please subscribe, leave us a review, or even buy us a coffee via the link on the algorithmicadvantage.com. We really appreciate it. Welcome back, everyone, to the Algorithmic Advantage podcast. Thanks for joining us. Today we have Jerry Parker with us uh, in the studio after uh, spending a great uh, weekend with him uh, and some other turtle traders uh, the other weekend down in Sydney. You've probably seen that show, Episode 9. Uh, we wanted to follow up with Jerry and deep dive a little further. It was a great weekend, guys. Thanks very much for that. I hope you enjoyed yourself over here, Jerry, in Australia. Oh, it's fantastic. Are you kidding? Can't wait to come back and hang out some more and go to some different places. And uh, what a great place to visit. But I mean, I think Sydney would be just, anybody would love to live in Sydney. What a great place. Yeah, there's some beautiful spots. Next time, Jerry, you should get out to the rock get out to the sort of the, the red center that's a sort of a, a different landscape out there i think you'd love it right right exactly um tassie perth the rock yeah. so much so much to do few right, animals heavy. here and there we 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 uh we just happened to find that parrot as you came in that was that was actually funny. <laughs> yeah i guess there's a lot out there already on your history and your background and your your love for trend following um I would like to sort of, I guess, start very quickly if we could do the sort of three-minute overview on on your how you got started with that Turtles program. Maybe if you could tell the Turtles story at a super high level, because um, uh, some may have not have, may not have heard it, and then we could kind of launch into it from there. Sure. Well, it was simply uh, seeing an ad in the Wall Street Journal that uh, Richard Dennis posted to hire people to trade, teach them how to trade, come to Chicago. We'll teach you how to trade and we will give you money to trade. That's pretty hard to beat. <clears throat> um, and I was really into stocks and I'd sort of gotten into trend following a bit through re reading books and newsletters. Marty Zweig, who's a stock, stock guy here, is pretty famous. He was on Wall Street Week. He talked about trend. Um, and, but all, you know, obviously just in stocks, but then I picked up some books about futures and I was like, futures, okay, whatever. Currencies, commodities, sh sure. I don't see a problem with that. Shorts, of course. I mean, so I, I was very open minded, focused mm -hmm. on trend, but, um, reading about what trend followers did, it took you to more than just stocks. And so I, um, but, you know, of course, I sent my resume in and I got in. Everybody who sent their resume in, 1983, end of the fall of 83, everybody who's got a um, 100 uh, true-false uh, test, essentially. And so I had this test. You had to you know, take take a couple of weeks, send it back in. I, I was in working in public accounting, so I would carry this test around with me to all the audits and ask my friends who I was working with, like, what do you think about this question? And they'd say, false. I'd say, no, true, true. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was really into this test and taking as long as I could, possibly could to get it right and perfect. And um, a lot of questions about trend following and psychology, how to think about the markets, how to think about risk, taking risk, questions that you would never know the answer to. You kind of had to guess. And um, 
yeah, so I finally sent it in, got an interview, went up there and, you know, I was, my head was full of so much stuff. Uh, I was like packed full of information. And of course I was totally paralyzed. And then they really asked me too much uh, technical information, just asked me normal questions. And I thought I did pretty well in the interview. And they said that I had the highest score out of a thousand people on the Gosh. test. So that was kind of my claim to fame. I did really well on the test. Some people did really poorly on the test, but they had other things going for them. So just a normal accountant from Virginia, I needed something, you know, uh, more. And, uh, and that was doing well on the test. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't like you had to do well. It was just what I was my kind of my way of getting in. And so, um, yeah, they called me up and said, move to Chicago. And I was very, very happy. And I uh, could not wait. I knew it was one of the greatest opportunities ever. I thought that on day one, I thought it, the day that we, they closed the program down, it was just the greatest thing ever having a mentor like that. And it was so important to have that mentor, have that training. These guys were geniuses in math and in uh, computers and in actual trading in the pits and combining all that together. We were sort of equipped to go forward in the future, not just uh, over the next few years, because they taught us very early on, this is not just for the foreseeable future. This is for the rest of your life philosophy and uh, ideas that uh, you'll have to change the parameters. You'll want to change things up. And they were changing things quite a bit, the specifics of how to enter trades, exit trades, parameters. They were pretty keen on doing lots of research and keeping current. And they were, in 1983, you know, they were very concerned about uh, trend following stopping working. And I was like, why the hell did they hire us if they're so concerned about it stopping, you know, not working any longer? But from day one, we were just all paranoid about that. Whatever they put into our heads, we really... I've always you know, thought it's good to have a healthy degree of paranoia in trading. You've got to be on guard of something that's going to go wrong to be a good risk manager, really. Exactly. And they, and they talked about that as well. Um, you know, all the things that can possibly go wrong and how long it takes. I was uh, listening to Howard Marks podcast, which I've been tweeting this week, um, how long it takes, how many years and years it takes to really get a good, true sense of, do you have an edge? Does the system have an edge? Uh, you can have good performance and not have an edge or have bad performance. And it could take a, a year or two to sort of for you to see that, that you actually do have good performance. That's why back testing is so important. So you can short circuit that go to the big, long back test and get ready to trade. Hey, those hundred questions, Jerry, uh, do you think they would still be relevant today? Are they sort of, were they universal enough that you think they would be the right questions to ask a pr prospective trader today? Oh, that's a very good question. They're out there on the internet somewhere. So I'm, I don't remember I too many 40, of them. 4020, Jerry, 4020, I think, have those questions. Oh, 40 in, 20 out. 40 in, 20 out. Think yeah, is. yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, some of them that I remember really well are kind of trivial. It takes money to make money, true or false. Uh, a trader should love their losses, true or false. Um, yeah. I, I think they would be sort of good, but I think they're kind of unnecessary as well. Because what, yeah. really what they wanted and what, you know, I would want if I was to hire someone is kind of a clean slate. We'll take these guys with above average intelligence. Um, who seem like nice people and we want, we don't want them to be contaminated by bad ideas. Um, I remember one of the questions they asked on the, in the, not on the test, but, uh, on, in the, in the interview was, are you a C, are you a registered CTA? And like no one knew what that meant. I think people thought it meant, are you a registered CPA? <laughs> so they kind of, pref <laughs> they kind of, pref yeah, they kind of preferred like you not to know too much. So you yeah. had to unwind a lot of bad thinking. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what that test was good for. Like I said, they hired people who had great resumes, smart people who did poorly on the test. So it was well, all Jerry, kinds Jerry, of you nailed, you nailed that test. So here's a question <clears throat> for you. What makes an accountant? A good trend trader? I think, uh, well, I'm not really sure if it's accounting or me being an accountant or me in general, but I would just say uh, the desire for objectivity, following rules, needing a rule, 
uh, loving, I mean, I just love charts, you know, looking at charts, the, uh, seeing the trends, putting up breakouts and moving averages, um, a process, rules. I, you know, I embrace those type of things. So a lot of people over the years I've met, they have really like, uh, feel hemmed in by these rules and, uh, Everyone knows you should get in or get out right now and you can't do it. This is just too much to take. You know, I have the freedom to, to get out when I know I should get out. And of course, Rich's response is that would be, you don't know it's time to get out. No one knows that. It feels like it might be time, but in hindsight, if you use that kind of discretion, you'll be wrong about as many times as you'll be right. Early eighties. This was early eighties. So January 84. Okay. Yeah. January 84. So this is before sort of the launch of algorithms. So was the intent of the experiment to turn the traders into algorithms effectively? That's a good question. I think that I think uh, I've heard a lot of stuff. We heard a lot of rumors and conversations that people had, but I think it was mainly uh, to see if trading could be taught. And then for I think as time went on, Rich was less interested in following a set of rules. So I think he was saying, I tell you what, I want to trade, you know, $50 million doing my own thing. Uh, and I'll give 50 million to the turtles and they'll be my system people. And so I can, with a good conscience, have fun, you know, doing other things when they're, sh when they're short sugar, I'll be long sugar. And that's actually was a trade. He, he was buying sugar in 84 as it went straight down and we kept short being short. Trading against uh, and that was one of, yeah, kind of. I think he <laughs> thought it as a as sort of a um, hedge. inflation hedge. He said, uh, "I think inflation's coming back, and the one thing I know that won't work very well with the next bout of inflation will be gold. So I'll just choose commodities or sugar." And the um, kind of the final test, uh, final question, the oral oral question at the uh, Christmas party, December nineteen eighty three was someone going around and asking all the turtles uh, this question. Uh, if Rich, if you hear that Rich is short soybeans, <laughs> but the system says to be long soybeans, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And, of course, you follow the system, you're long soybeans. <laughs> yeah. How long did it take to, for them to impart the rules, and then how long did you keep trading thereafter, or was it just an ongoing constant mentorship, Jerry? Both. It took uh, – these rules were super sub objective, and there was a little bit of uh, psych psychology training, statistic uh, brush-up, and then uh, two, two weeks. I think it was two mm -hmm. weeks. It may have been three, uh, but I think it was two. We were done. It was kind of sink or swim. Do, your, do what you're supposed to do. If you make money uh, and follow the rules, you'll be in good shape. If you don't follow the rules, you're not going you're to be in trouble. Uh, but there was some mentoring along the way when we had big drawdowns or they had some new wisdom to impart, a new, new piece of research. So maybe once a quarter, there would be something material, like here's a new system. Um, here's you know system one, system two. Then there was something called system three. I think system four was do, do what you want to do. 25% of your money, you can just do whatever you want to do. System three was trend following, but kind of, kooky and crazy trend following. Um, but yeah, it, it was very infrequent uh, that they would come over and, uh, but it was mostly, you know, they would have a meeting and say, uh, we, you guys are losing a lot of money. What do you think about that? Do you think we should take money away from you? Do you think we should give you more money? And we said, well, we think we're doing all the right trades. So, Please don't take the money away from us. And they said, "Yeah, you're right. You're doing the right <laughs> trades. Here's here's more money." No, and of course, so that was the that was the low of the period, and everything took off after that. They were, you know, pretty good at that sort of stuff. But Rich was a chronic over trader. Uh, obviously, when you start from almost zero and you make a couple hundred million, you know, you're not trading the way that Rich and I trade now. It's you, you when you're trying to raise money and have clients, it's much different. But this was a strategy that did not need clients. Just keep – we were making 200% a year. So um, – he was, but he was a big overtrader, which got him in trouble sometimes, and he struggled, I think. Uh, so I hear that uh, continuing to 
to do the systems. Someone mm-hmm. told me in the second turtle class, which was the fall of 84, one year later, that he wrote on the board, here's my ability to follow the rules over time. And it was like going straight down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how many years were you, were you with um, Rich and... Uh... So 84 through 87, and it ended in the February of 88. And I think they just got tired of it. Uh, it was supposed to be five years, but mm-hmm. I ended it a year, uh, almost a year early. And um, people were moving out of the office and not staying in Chicago. And it was kind of a bummer. We had a great camaraderie for the first two or three years. People were moving out and doing their own thing from home. And I think Rich was off to other things, raising money from the public, or trading in funds. And I think they just got tired of it. You know, they're super wealthy people. Their attention span was something like this. is going to be short. And it was a fair amount of managing people, which is absolutely no fun having a bunch of employees, as you probably well know. Jerry, was there continuous assessment over the course of the program or did they just uh, base it on the performance of the traders that have these regular meetings, those sort of things? How, how did they assess and how did they... They, they wean out those that were underperforming versus those that were overperforming, or did they do that at all? Not really. They didn't try to get rid of people who were uh, underperforming so much. It was people misbehaved and were doing things, you know, and maybe if they lost, like, way too much money. So you had one person who got booted out because he just misbehaved. One guy got maybe booted out because he – tremendous underperformance. But there was material underperformance all the time, and they were just pretty tolerant about it. They didn't really care too much. Uh, from my point of view, there was a lot of, you know, here are the rules and here's what, and a lot of feedback we were getting. But it also took, you had to sort of figure out that that really wasn't necessarily, you know, what was happening. You know, there was, like they say, don't trade too large. But then if somebody did trade really large, they would get an extra chunk of money. So you had to kind of understand, like, well, they're saying this, but then they're doing that. Um, so it took a little bit of understanding what they really meant or what they really, really, really believe. Trade small. You'll never trade small, trade, um, conservatively. That was like hammered into us, but people who traded large got most of the money. So you had to pick up on those things. Um, yeah. So it was, that took a little bit. That was a little frustrating. To, um, you lived really. and breathed this over the experiment. So, so <clears throat> when you got home at night, was it were you constantly thinking about what you did during the day? What were your thoughts during that period of time? Were you just totally focused on trend following the turtle way? Um, you know, did you have spare time or were you just totally invested in it? Oh, we had lots of spare time, you know, because the markets closed about two and uh, – so 7.30 to 2 p.m., basically. We played a lot of ping pong, a lot of computer games. But I think that people did think about it, uh, although everything was handed to us on a silver platter, and we were fed research. We were fed what to do. Um, but I definitely thought about it, uh, but not in the sense that not being super creative like I am now. Like in 1988, when I started Chesapeake, I had to be super creative. Uh, but then it was just doing what Rich told you to do. I think they wanted the turtles to also, um, I left this part out. They wanted us to offer feedback. Like, what do you think about these systems? Are we too short term, too long term? How would you help? But it became more, uh, people sort of perceived, um, that you're going to lose a lot more if you deviated. So it was like, Hey, don't be different. Don't be too different. Having everyone in the same office had these psychological impacts on people that maybe they didn't foresee. Uh, if we would have all went home, back home and traded remotely, it could have been much different. But I remember, um, you know, there was, there was one place to buy the soybeans and like everyone picked the phone up at the same time. Mm. And, uh, and then if someone picked it up like a, a minute earlier, we we're going like, what's he doing? What's he doing? Wait a second. Let me recalculate <laughs> this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 it developed into everyone doing pretty much the same thing. And even though Rich wanted us to be more creative. And uh, I remember someone, I told the story once at a turtle reunion. Um, 
to the guy that it happened to. He, he used a longer term exit once. And so they came over and they said, write us a paragraph on what you think about this longer term exit. And, uh, evidently it worked pretty well. And uh, so they were really uptight about it. And so, um, that was the only time I remember anybody sort of going off the reservation, except trading too large. And I told this story to the guy that it happened to. And he said that never happened before. He said it never mm-hmm. happened. You, he said I made it up. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. these turtles. Um, not sure about the, not sure about all these turtle stories. <laughs> indeed, Jerry, I'd love to ask about that next transition. Really, I haven't heard much about this in the past. So you've you've done this training. You've been taught some rules you've effectively excuse me worked in this pop sh- prop shop um learn how to trade fairly short term as i understand it um and uh actually i was going to ask as well is back then you probably had to manually filter through uh contracts and setups like you wouldn't have had computers driving everything back then were you manually looking for um for break breakouts or scanning the whole universe of futures, how was that working? Well, we um, we were told the markets to trade, and they didn't change very much. And we had a chart book that we got every Monday morning, and we filled in the graph paper with a pencil. And I think that's why we use breakouts because you can see the breakout on the chart book. But calculating the moving average crossovers, you need something to do that. We had computers then, Excel. We had that. Uh, I got my first computer around that time, Apple's mm-hmm. especially. But, uh, yeah, uh, it was just counting back the weeks, you know, the t- two-week, four-week breakouts and that sort of thing. So, And we got the ATRs given to us every, probably every week or every month. It was pretty mm-hmm. delayed. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, sorry, I just wanted to check that. But, yeah, my question really was then, um, I presume that was fairly short term. You're making 200% a year. You must have been making a fair number of trades. How did you transition? Like, what was your thinking then in leaving that program and deciding that you wanted to trade other people's money, start a fund? Um, You know, did you... Did you immediately realize that you would need to de-risk or go longer term? or how, What was the thinking there? And then just commercially, how did you get started? Well, I met um, people in New York who, um, wanted, who believed in my track record. So coming out of the turtle program, we had a four-year track record, and mm. it was audited. And so... We were really, really lucky. I mean, we had evidence of our performance. Richard Dennis was famous. And these guys that uh, raised money on Wall Street, they were saying, sure, we've got all kinds of crazy investments and we'll throw some your way. And um, obviously, it wasn't difficult to figure out that a 50, 60 percent drawdown uh, and going for 200 percent was not going to be commercially safe mm-hmm. and the thing to do. So we... I think I tried to knock it down to like uh, estimated to be something like 20%, but I probably was still trading too large. I think it's difficult for traders to really um, get get to a leverage, a, a level of leverage and risk where it's low enough. They I, Many times in my career, I've said, okay, now it's it's got to be low enough. And it never was. I would lose. I'd have another drawdown that was too big for me. So I think um, it just took me a long time. I, getting them down from 200 percent is pretty easy, but getting down to a level that people can kind of deal with, especially back in those days, was maybe 20 markets. Uh, so you had a lot of uh, drawdowns and volatility, even going for 20 percent a year. And by the rule that I we used to come up with was whatever your um, the back test says as relates to your. Kager, you can expect your drawdown to at least be twice as much. So if you're going to go for 20, you're going to have a drawdown of 40. I think that's changed a bit because we trade over 300 markets now, but you should still be ready for that and uh, be ready for those drawdowns. Jerry, the foundational investors that came into Chesapeake, are they still with you today? Did they stick with you for the long term? How did that go? 
No, they did not. Um, they didn't stick with us for the long term. In fact, right out of the gate, so 1988, I had a drawdown. As soon as I started my company, and almost all the money went away just in a couple of months. And then uh, there was the big drought of 19, Midwest drought of 1988. And then we made a lot of money. And then those clients came back <laughs> after we made all the money. And they had the audacity to ask me to reinstate their, um, you know, the, um, what's that, the drawdown? High watermark um, or something. The high watermark, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, <laughs> so, yeah, no, nobody can can ha stay with it. Um, and these guys would pepper me with questions and be a little skeptical, but it wasn't really their money. It was their client's money. So they were only kind of influenced by the influence they got from their clients. But yeah, right out of the gate, you know, we leave there. We have the guy who's taught us everything. He loves what he's taught us. It's his stuff. He gives us the money. If we lose money, he gives us more money. And he just says, bottom line, follow the rules. That's it. Mm -hmm. Follow the rules. Total pretend, fictitious environment that everyone just would love to be in. And then your first client, as soon as you have a drawdown, they're gone. Mm. So we got, yeah, so that's quite a bit different than what we were expecting. Did you but have people some help agree early on? Sorry, Jerry. Did you have some help in terms of you immediately went and got a, a researcher or a developer to help you with, um, you know, back testing some new strategies and reducing risk and that kind of thing? Well, my first employee was a really talented guy, super talented, one of the most talented people I ever hired just right out of the gate mm. with math and uh, computers. And he was doing things that, um, was, in hindsight, were just amazing at that time. Uh, and so, yeah, he, we were we were doing some research. But I think at that point, the most important thing was um, to trade smaller, continue to trade smaller. You don't want to have a 20% drawdown in a few weeks right out of the gate. So um, I think uh, – Protecting your capital, especially initially, especially with new clients, is super important. And it wasn't so much a system failure. It's just the implementation of the system. We do have lots of discretion on how we implement things and how large we trade. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it was... How did, you do your, how did you do your marketing in those, um, those days, Jerry? What did you do to um, attract more um, clients into the firm? Well, I had these guys... And uh, who were, had lots of clients. And then the beginning of Managed Futures was starting. And Managed Futures was coming from the major wirehouses, Merrill, Smith Barney, Dean Witter, Morgan Stanley, um, <clears throat> Prudential, with departments that were raising money to go uh, for CTAs, for trend following, with very, very high fees. And then there would be smaller groups coming together. And, um, you know, you, they had no trouble paying R2 and 20 because they were going to lop on even more fees. So somehow we survived that before Abu Dhabi came along with uh, a really institutional client for almost all the CTAs in the early 90s. But the other half of the business was a crappy managed futures with these high fees and no loyal clients. And no one was really loyal to the clients. Um, if you tried to make changes, like, can we trade stocks? Uh, no, you can't trade stocks. This is futures only. We have a, we have a process here, a game here. We're getting these people in here. We're all charging these high fees. It's not going to last for very long. So it was a pretty disgusting beginning. Um, <clears throat> managed futures was with all the bad products and bad, um, High, high fee products and really no concern with the clients whatsoever. Just get them in. And if you guys make money, that's going to be great. Maybe we can keep them uh, a while. But then Abu Dhabi comes in and just takes over managed futures and starts throwing around hundreds of millions and billions of dollars to lots of people with institutional fees. So at least half the track record was starting to look very, very respectable. And they just uh, were the first and maybe only uh, group or institution to really get in there and say, we love this. We love CTAs and trend follow. I remember visiting over there and talking to them and they would just love on us. And when they would say, we just got to forge this close relationship. And they said, uh, of all of the different parts of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, the CTAs are making the most amount of money. We're the best. We're the highest. <laughs> and so 
We were on cloud nine with those guys for over 20 Very years. Very sensible it's, investors, it's, Jerry. <laughs> amazing. Amazing so, investors. Jerry, I'd love it kind to. Of only, um, it kind of only started going downhill when they made this decision to phase out uh, the local guys running and bring in the New Yorkers from Wall Street to run that that big fund. So I think uh, that's when it's, in my opinion, sort of going all downhill that um, the New Yorkers came in and said, what's this trend following? We don't like it. We can do it in-house. So, Jerry, I know that on, you know, every chance you get, you talk about trend following, and obviously that is um, uh, something that you've grown to love. What I'm interested in is that growth as well. So how have you managed to stick with, trend following for so long and you know i really would love to know to what extent you've been tempted to um do other research into other forms of um trading making money in the markets like where's that research gone and and has that just always petered out and brought you back to trend following what's the what's the the research that you've done around that and and how have you stuck with trend for so long well, we at some point we had to. Uh, our research was indicating we should be longer term. This was uh, in the late '90s. We just this was the big change for us. We pretty much kept everything just like the turtle training, except uh, the look back periods instead of 20 days, 100 days, 100 days plus at on these 40 breakouts. 40 markets still, Jerry. Just sorry, just 40 we were adding markets. Stage. We were adding, we were the world's best at adding more and more markets, uh, trying to get into the stocks and then any type of new financial currency, bond, commodities. And we were really good at adding markets. Now, nowadays you hear about the guys who are doing 500 markets, a lot of futures, China, um, over the counter type markets. We weren't doing that, but we were sticking with the uh, futures markets and trying to force our clients to let us trade individual stocks. Um, all the time we were like just really intense about that, but yeah, doing the, 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 the longer term systems, this was a, a big, um, uh, a big part of what we were doing is, um, in, in trying to incorporate the stocks and, uh, become more, um, more diversified and stick with the fundamentals, the one entry, one exit and a stop loss, letting profits run, hunting for outliers, taking small losses. We were so in, uh, into all of this and understanding why it worked that we didn't really feel the need. You know, Rich said at one point, uh, if you, he would sort of be in favor of trading a, a system that didn't make money. If it doesn't make money, that's okay because it'll help when your trend following is doing poorly. But we never could embrace that idea. We would look at things like that, but we were just like, look, we're just going to make less money. Let's just find clients who love trend following and we're, we don't want to do that. Um, I think like every trader out there, maybe, uh, I don't even know why I said that, but maybe it makes me feel better. We did over optimize at one point. We tried to put in too many other ideas, like let's take some profits or let's volatility scale. And we heard people were doing this. Our first 10 years, we made money every year, I think. And so we were like, well, now what's next? We got to be even better. Making money every year is not good enough. And so we got into things that were really negative and hurt the systems and were over optimized. And we quickly unwound all of that and went back to our core. And then Is we it just adopted. Because the market punished you immediately. You yeah, punished us. <laughs> it punished us immediately. Yeah. We had this back test and we like, look at this back test. This thing is amazing. And then probably the first three months of trading or six months of trading, we saw things. That we'd never seen in the back test. You know, we're like, this is horrible. <laughs> and so this is exactly how it's, it's supposed to work. And thankfully we got spanked for six months and not for a lot longer. <laughs> you know, we were, we reversed it all and we, we promised never to do that again. And then we adopted this thing, trend following plus nothing and only doing trend following and really thinking that this was really going to help us. Uh, but we overestimated how much the rest of the world would love trend following like we did. And mm -hmm. so that was not, not a great marketing idea to just, uh, because at some point, you know, the other CTAs who were at our size, cause we were at two and a half billion at one point, uh, they were venturing over into carry and short term pattern recognition, um, 
and other strategies, mean reversion, and really playing it up. And we were like, hell no, we're just going to do trend following because we love it. We understand it. It preserves capital. It makes the most amount of money. And that's why we couldn't get off of it. We were very concerned about safety and capital preservation, but we did not want to give up uh, the potential profit. And I have not found anything that is able to do both of those, like trend following, especially the trend following I was taught. I mean, I think we just were given uh, a great training. And so I have not heard too many people um, that gave me the impression that they knew as much about trend following as we were taught. So maybe it's easier for us because we started at the top. So what do you think of um, the Renaissance Medallion Fund? You weren't uh, tempted to try and throw every bit of compute power and research at the market and do as many things as possible and make 66% a year like Jim Simons? Well, that's a very good point you make there. So the answer to that is um, I knew myself, I knew my limitations and I knew what I was interested in and I knew um, that I didn't want to work like that. And I think, yes, there are some things out there that work better than trend following. But I had what I had and I thought that was pretty wonderful and I wanted to maximize that. But if I'd have gone to work in 1983 with Renaissance and they would have sent me a 100 true false questions. Yeah. I'd be a different person, you know, mm. and maybe I would be better and smarter, but this is my fate. And that was one thing I wanted to maximize. I didn't want to have this regret of mm. dude, you were given, you were given all of this out of who the, who, who could even imagine this sort of uh, gift that you were given. And then you wanted to branch off into other stuff and, uh, yeah, that never made sense to me. I had sort of no, a moral it's... and a cosmic responsibility to maximize this in some way. And it's good like. to specialize sometimes too, isn't it? So, you know. I think that's one thing that doesn't... Rich Rich has really taught me or made me think of even stronger is that there is a lot to this trend following. It's deep. Mm. Rich can take us all very, very deep into this and – you're like, damn, it is a lot to it. It's a lot more than just entry, exit, stop loss. <laughs> it's fun to I'm, know I'm why you're doing I'm convinced you can invest your life in trend following at, to develop the perfect trend following system. Like, I, I don't think any of us are there yet, but I think there's so yeah. much more scope to make it even much more, much better. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trading very is not optimistic the, about it. Trading's not yeah. the field you want to be a, 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 a jack of all trades, master of none. Better off specializing. And if, if you're in these other games like execute. mean reversion and finding different alphas and all of those things, you're continually strategy hopping, you know, looking for these things. But in trend following, the consistency of it, its applicability across different market regimes means you can focus on the one thing for the rest of your life as far as I'm concerned. And, and you, you know, you just sort of touched on before, Jerry, distinguishing between managed futures and CTAs or, or trend following and managed futures. And um, can you just – let's just talk about this for, for very briefly because in Australia we've really got the one regulator and now even the one exchange that, that, that provides futures and uh, stocks, really. So when I look at the um, – and, and not really quite being of that era too. When I look at the, uh, when they talk about managed futures and that it just means trend following, um, I wonder if that has a lot to do with the fact that there are the two regulators over there, the, the SEC regulating stocks, the CFTC regulating futures. Ironically, back no, in the day. because, um, no, it's really just my, it's just like me. It's just one of my complaints and pet peeves that, um, CTAs back in the 80s started out as trend following and then they've sort of gotten away from it and now it's trend following plus all the things that we've mentioned. It's really trying to justify the incentive fee, uh, which I think is a good idea commercially um, and uh, more of a quant based and they'll, the managed futures CTAs kind of admit to, yeah, we use trend following, but there's a lot more to it than that. And in order to uh, have higher fees, they have to play up those other 
things. And so I just think trend following is a separate category. I used to say, well, I wish they would quit calling it managed futures and call it trend following. But that was totally wrong headed because trend following is done, uh, classic trend following the way that Rich and I do it is done by so few people, maybe 10, 10, 10 total in the world. And so that deserves its own category. It's, it's trend following and managed future CPAs. They use some trend following, but it's not the kind of trend following that we like and the kind that lets profits run, hunts outliers. And, um, the trend following itself is modified in a way that's unfortunate. And it's, uh, added to with this mean reversion, carry trade, pattern recognition on and on quat stuff. Yeah, to where it's almost unrecognizable to um, to more classic trend following, which is, in my opinion, is better, and it's just a shame. So we're here to sort of uh, put up a fight to don't you know don't take our trend following away from us and call it something else. You know, it is what it is, and what they what this managed futures industry does is something different. And so one of my missions in life is to trade three or 400 markets, put trend following in a situation where it can uh, show what it can really do without uh, watering it down and taking small profits rather than letting profits run and adding other things to it. It doesn't need this help. In, people need to do whatever they need to do to, to earn two and 20 or earn an incentive fee. That's me being very negative and nasty accusing them of doing that. <laughs> but I think that's basically the reason they do it. Although I do think that there's so many quiet people involved in managed futures now that they really do enjoy. It gets so totally bored uh, compared to Rich and me uh, if they just sort of said, well, all we do is trend following. Mm. Jerry, what, okay, did you Rich. Think of, um, what, did, what did you think of ALP in the spaces last week where he referred to this term sales alpha? I love that. Um, I love sales alpha. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that and Niels has said as much. He's like, hey, you know, uh, creating a, a, a trend following firm or CTA firm is more to it than just the systems. And don't criticize us for having sales alpha and doing things within our systems that makes people think highly of us and want to pay us more money. I agree totally. Um, so I agree. There's no he is 100 percent correct. But I'm going to do my thing, which is to try to do it another way. We stick with the trend following, make it better and wonderful with more markets and more more ways of doing it, uh, and and try to see if it can't compete against managed futures, which literally can be anything, but usually now is a bit of trend following, a bit, um, uh, but too many compromises, you know, too many. Uh, too much, too much rule breaking from us classic guys. So, Jerry, I'd love to um, again push away from some of the other um, podcasts that uh, you've done and, and talked a bit more about your systems and also talk about traders who are getting started in trend following. Um, so, you often, you know, talk about having learned to follow the rules no matter what. And of course, the, the newbie trader comes, a lot, comes away from that saying, okay, but what rules? Um, you know, if you were to give some advice to to those starting out in trend following, are there some uh, insights into the way you think you should go about it? You know, trend uh, breakouts versus moving averages or using regimes or not using regimes, um, markets, um, volatility stops, time frame of trades, you know, things like that to, to get started. There's so many things that goes into it. Um, but yeah, I think one entry, one exit, the stop loss. You can use moving averages or breakouts. I don't think it really, uh, matters that much. Longer term is going to be good. Trade as many markets as possible. Trade small. Uh, I think, um, most people today, they just can't start and stop with the most uh, simple type of strategy that has very few parameters and rules and really is going to be really, really good at hanging on to these unforeseen trends that we'll see in the future. Uh, the back testing now, I think, uh, just tempts people to make things a lot more 
have a lot more rules and parameters and uh, try to fine tune the data way too much. I used to, I'll sit there and look at charts. I know when we've done a lot of heavy duty research and especially when we were thinking, hey, let's, we got to be longer term. The first thing I did was just go through weekly charts and I just go through every chart and look at the trades that had the big trends. And I would say, okay, this seems to me to be kind of a good look back period. Um, it gets me, in, it, it keeps me in the trade, but it doesn't get back all the profit. And then I would just tell my researchers, here's the parameters I think that works. And then they said, yeah, you're right. Those are the parameters that work. That sort of longer term look back. They make the most amount of money, um, per, uh, loss, per, you know, per, per, um, for a small loss. And we would say, okay, and so let's go with that. So we would try to look at the trade stats only, and we would um, use some common sense to begin with and see if the computer confirmed it rather than telling the computer, you know, do, as, do, do whatever you can to tell us what the be best parameters are. We never even thought about, thought about it in those terms. What, what are the best parameters? We thought these parameters look pretty good and uh, we were, we were correct. <clears throat> but, um, mm. Yeah, it's such a complicated thing to devise a system. And um, it's so many moving parts. And it's like building a house and trying to figure out what's the most important thing. Um, the basics of building a trading system we talk about on X Spaces every week and on podcast a lot. But um, so few people are willing to accept that. Back in the day, you know, Rich said, I could post my rules on the front page of the New York Times and no one would follow them. And I think back then he meant it's, they're too hard to do. You're buying the highs, selling the lows, taking small losses. Profits turn into losses. Big profits turn into small profits. Now it's, it means something different in my mind. It means if you tell me your rules, I'll tell you where you're wrong. <laughs> mm. So you may have been around for 40 years, dude. But I don't think you're right. And so this is what I hear <laughs> almost all the time from Twitter and from people in, in, in spaces and on podcasts is that, no, you're wrong. Um, you know, uh, you're, you're doing it incorrectly. We, we can have more parameters. We can have more fitting of the past data. Um, here's what fits our personality. That's the, the worst idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you'd have asked me the other questions, like what are some of the things people should never do? <laughs> That's a, that would have probably been something I would be better at. But yeah, fitting mm -hmm. your personality to your trading. Um, now, mm -hmm. your personality needs to be in there to trade smaller or larger. Now, if your personality is, is like, I can take a lot of drawdown like Mulvaney, well, be careful because that could lead you to losing too much money and going out of it and losing and getting out of it and being forced to be uh, your fund you know, to no longer exist. But yeah, if you're really, really conservative, okay, trade small. If you're, or if you're medium, then trade medium. But uh, that's where that sort of uh, my personality, quote unquote, needs to stop. You know, my personality is, has nothing to do with what, with the way I trade. <laughs> mm. I What's the worst to you, Jerry? That, that statement about the personality or the statement about you can never go broke taking a profit? Which, which one do you hate the worst? <laughs> um, I think uh, the second one is a, I can prove it's wrong. The first one, it's harder to prove. People don't want to believe that because they'll say something like, well, if you're not willing to do it, then you can't follow the system. And then you keep saying the most important thing is to follow the system. So I have to have a system that I can follow, which means I have to have a system that um, is suits my personality. You know, I think the alternative is, dude, don't trade. You're not cut out for it. That yeah. needs to be an option. Uh, well, I think the thing I dislike the most is, unfortunately, uh, it's this thing that I hear a lot, which is everything is the same. There is no difference. You do it your way, Rich. I'll do it my way. Managed Futures does it their way. And we'll all end up in this happy spot. Consequences and choices don't matter. And I think that they do matter. And I would never have that attitude as well. You do it your way. You're trend following. I'm trend following. We can both call it trend following. Who needs to get into the specifics and details? This is like, this is like insane. 
you better get into the specifics. Since, since when has the world become a level level playing field? You know, um, certain people, things are better than others. Yeah. People underestimate yeah. what what it is to put together a thirty year track record. I mean, to live through that many years. There's changes. There's changes in the environment, the markets, the technology. Um, you know, back tests and short track records can can look very good for a while, but as Rich and I uh, did a show recently on, and, and I think you tweeted something as well, Jerry, recently, just about how um, how easy it is to look like a genius for a trade or a number of trades or a number of years, uh, and, and it's really quite alluring, but um, you can be doing something fundamentally wrong and make profit for a little while. And uh, A pressure. I think that's, that's the biggest thing for me is just the pressure. 30 years of every day is pressure. These markets are the most competitive environment around, and then we're suddenly told to trade what suits our personality. Come on. <laughs> the pressure of losing money and negative feedback from clients, um, having drawdowns, being on top and being on the bottom, uh, it's really tough. It's a tremendous amount of pressure, personal. When people redeem and, and take money away, it's a personal comment on you and your ability at least that's the way i felt i'm sure it wasn't mm. necessarily all the time but that type of pressure of are you still going to do the next trade i've had trader friends who one guy in particular salem you probably know salem um but he is the world's best at being in the midst of a drawdown and never hesitating to take that next trade that's really this a huge sign uh, can you take the next trade without hesitation? Because you have this unbelievable belief in your system. Uh, I love trend following, and I think it's wonderful. But I haven't always had the kind of faith and in, uh, in my systematic approach in the rules in the sense that where it really mattered. I stepped up when the times were hard and enthusiastically put on that next trade. And that's what you have to train yourself to do. Uh, of course, that's what I'm going to do. It's the only thing to do. I have, uh, Rich was the, was the best at uh, no emotions, no emotion. There's no emotion, don't really care. Emotions and um, drawdowns have nothing to do with doing the next trade. And that's where you have to get. And it takes time mm. and experience and failure to get there. Good to be thick skinned in trading. Jerry, I wanna ask about then, um, like I have actually heard you say that you would adopt anything that would improve your performance. So I'd like to ask what your research team is working on at the moment or, or has worked on over the last few years, the kinds of things that uh, you're putting them to work on, so to speak, that you could, um, there's obviously a core philosophy of of what you believe in, but as you're looking to, because I know you're someone who is um, always looking to self-improve, improve your health, your your mindset and, and all of that kind of thing. So I know you've got a pursuit of excellence mindset. So what are the kind of things then that you're happy putting people to work on researching to further enhance the, the trend following endeavor? I think a lot of our research is um, trying to come up with back tests and charts and graphs that show people how great trend following is and how it works and how it compares to other things. But we have this one project we've been working on for a long, long time. And I think we are making some headway. And I don't know, I don't know if Rich agrees with this, uh, this idea, but, um, I, I do. I think this, I think it's just my, this one big project I've been working on for so long and I cannot give it up. And it basically is trend following, uh, spreads trend following two different markets. And I thought about this many, many years ago um, because I thought it's perfectly normal and natural to trade currency pairs, Euro Swiss, Aussie Canada, Aussie New Zealand, Aussie Yen. These things are traded. Uh, they're traded by people who live in those countries and they're traded by Americans who don't live in those countries. And uh, we trade 40 of these markets and they are pretty decent trenders. We're short the yen against everything. And we calculate the entry, the exit based upon that uh, Aussie yen chart. We calculate the ATR based upon the Aussie yen. And so my idea was, well, let's take this to some extreme and do um, soybeans and corn. 
you know, why not? What's stopping us from doing that? It's uh, two different markets. They have a relationship. They may trend. Um, I certainly did not believe that they had to have an official market like Aussie Canada, that you can go to a bank and trade that at almost any bank. I thought, no, I'll create this sort of synthetic spread in the same way. And I think we finally have made some headway on this and figured out how to put these trades on. And But it's been really, really difficult. I know Moritz has worked on this as well. And That's uh, exciting, I went to Lee, Jerry. That's going to Lisa. open up your diversification. Usually. Oh, it's just it's just amazing. I mean, it's just think about it. It would just mean hundreds and thousands of different markets, synthetic markets. You'd have to have this major computer program that went through all the different pairs and then netted out the positions and showed you. And this is uh, better than kind of a relative strength or um, uh, cross-sectional momentum where you take the top 20%, you go long, the, the worst 20%, you go short. This is still sticking with our core philosophy of one entry, one exit, and the stop loss. Everything is a market now. So there is a uh, soybean market. We count those trades. There is a Aussie, uh, Aussie Canada market. We count those trades. Now there could be this corn soybean market. And we count that trade and we build up this sample size in the same way. And that was this part I was not willing to give up on. I didn't want to do relative strength that I think a lot of CTAs do now where it's not this, um, you know, counting up the trades and creating this synthetic market. So we were not willing to compromise on that. That's one of the things uh, about our research is that we were never willing to compromise and violate our principles and our core beliefs. And then that put us in a situation where there wasn't much research to do because we weren't willing to uh, change them too much and, and add more rules and more parameters. So, uh, but this has been like a, an unbelievable 20 year project of and so much failure that I think recently we just kind of conquered this issue. I'm not sure if it's going to be how profound it was going to, it's going to be in the future, but I feel intellectually satisfied that I've made huge progress on trend following spreads. Yeah. Corn. Wheat. And, uh, yeah, anything. And of course, you, you're trend following stocks, which is different to a lot of those futures only programs. That's right. So obsessed with trend following Jerry's stocks. Jerry's going to get scary, you know. He's already now significantly in equities. Now he's going to go into these spreads, possibly. Like, this, this is full on. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Yes. Well, Rich, I, I remember convincing myself years ago I'd like for you to, uh, uh, you're a math guy, you, you tell me how to calculate this this uh, idea, calculate this probability. But, you know, if you have an edge and you're trading thousands and thousands of markets, uh, trend following, I mean, at some point you're going to trade so many markets that you're going to make money almost every month, every day, every every quarter uh, by just having so many different markets to trade. You're really able to move that um, prop pro Profitability, probability to some really short terms uh, it would seem to me. Um, so this always excited me. I think me. you're right, Jerry. I think yeah. these outliers, they exist everywhere. Um, you know, when we're focusing on these limited portfolios, we're only seeing them sporadically in particular areas. But when you open that up to this maximum diversification, you're talking about spreads, um, different spread opportunities, et cetera, the outlier, the frequency of them and where they consolidate, it's much more distributed. So you're, you're finding that there's almost an outlier every day as you sort of get to this sort of maximum diversification, which lends well to your argument, Jerry, that, um, you know, you're just going to be continuously profitable. Um, so, yeah, I, I see that because I certainly see in terms of diversification in the theory that I'm doing in my research when I'm persistently lifting my levels of diversification. Of course, we get the smoothing, but the smoothing isn't of, uh, it's not the smoothing you get when you mix it with inferior strategies, uncorrelated strategies. This is a smoothing you get from the non-linearity of the outliers um, being distributed across the time series. So because they're so well distributed, we do get a fairly straight line, but it's got massive lifting power. Um, so... You know, I think that's when we're talking about theoretically 
where should we be aiming our objectives in trend following? Well, it's towards this optimal, optimal trend following model that totally embraces diversification, what Jerry's talking about, going this next level, continually going the next level in diversification in our hunt for outliers. I, I can't see any problems with that. Well, yeah, no, definitely. I almost, I almost forgot about the stocks. You know, this is another thing that is a little sad about managed futures that I don't think any investment strategy, especially one like ours, is going to be taken very seriously if you, if you just don't trade stocks. I mean, it's kind of silly. It's managed futures. It's what it is. It's what people have told us it's supposed to be. Uh, it has to be accessible in a futures account. And I'm like, no, this, yes, that is managed futures, but I'm trend following and the, the world is my oyster. Every market is my, is possible for me. And I'm not going to be limited by an FCM account, a futures only account. There's so much going on in uh, lots of different markets, ETFs and stocks. There's so much diversification and trends to be found there. Uh, and so this is really a sad situation where, um, the model, the business model that I think they initially were all forced into, and now I think the cap, the captives have agreed with their captors to stay uh, with inside this um, limitation of uh, futures only and managed futures, and not allowing uh, the trend following, the brilliant trend following strategy to uh, to trade the stocks as well, and I think. Uh, and then this sad situation of crisis alpha, where you take 10% of your assets and give it to CTAs or alternatives. And our idea is no, we, nothing is going to be trend following. Nothing's going to be trend following stocks. These stocks don't need an allocation to an alternative. They need a trailing stop and a stop loss. Well, maybe we'll have fewer crises. Great. <laughs> mm. right. Speaking so, of crises. Um, crisis alpha, Jerry, like someone comes to you today, an investor, and says, you know, the outlook for recession is actually really high. There's outlook for inflation. We're going through, um, you know, meltdown in so many areas. Um, can you, do you make a, a point about, you know, being more likely to protect your capital in a strategy like yours coming into an environment like that? Um, and you know, are there are there regimes or environments where trend following doesn't work so well? Well, when people bring up this idea of crisis alpha, I try to like downplay it. Like, duh, yeah, of course, we trade currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, long and short. Um, of course, when stocks go down, we're gonna uh, we may be short stocks, and we're gonna have all these other markets, and at least we're not fully feeling the full brunt of a stock market retreat because uh, we we have other markets as well. Now, of course, there has been times where everything went against us: uh, COVID, February, March, twenty twenty, and these periods can can uh, happen. But we just have such a huge advantage with the trend following, knowing exactly what to do: follow these systems, sell or buy those breakouts, and. As soon as we step on the pitch, we have this, we have a whole army of markets, not just stocks, not just long. So it's an unfair advantage that we have. Of course, we're going to possibly, probably do well all the time, especially, you know, and, and definitely we're not subject to, uh, the, we're going to be less subject to the whole portfolio really doing poorly, uh, you know, like the stocks. If we only traded stocks, you know, we would, we'd have the same issue or if we only traded bonds or commodities, but that's the key is not to do that and trade as many markets as possible. And um, it's almost impossible for a CTA to have as bad a performance as the stock market uh, around an 8% return in the U S and a 50 plus percent drawdown, even a, a mediocre trend following system with 50 markets probably is not going to have that bad of a performance, 8%. You try to make eight percent, your drawdown is probably not going to be nearly nearly fifty percent. Uh, so, you know, CTAs have this huge advantage. Uh, the trend following gives us a huge advantage, along with the idea that uh, I don't think trend following. I hear this as well. Trend following needs all these markets. I don't think it needs all those markets. We just take advantage of those markets. If we trend followed stocks, yeah, we'd look closer to eight percent return and a fifty percent drawdown. And if we only traded bonds or only traded commodities. 
well, why? Why would we even do that? We're already these weirdos who are willing to look at things technically, charts, uh, trend following, um, and not just buy and hold or fundamental analysis. So for us to say, okay, we'll be weird one more time and trade all these different markets, futures, long and short, of course we're going to do that. So, mm-hmm. um, but you know, I think, uh, you know, we went through a long period where stocks, you know, for 10 years or whatever, there was CTAs made some money sometimes, but it was not as good as the stock market. I don't think, once again, we exploited the stock market to the degree that we could have. There was one huge sector that, uh, managed futures only trades indexes. They're really inferior to trading individual markets. And, um, so that mistake will be made again. There'll be another bad period because stocks will have a, a, a period again. It's one, one of these days where they're the only game in town, the best trending markets. So if the industry doesn't shape up and start trading a lot of equities, uh, then it's going to be that same situation again. Um, I think what drives people really crazy is these drawdowns and, uh, even if you trade a thousand markets, you know, you're going to have drawdowns in some of these markets and it's going to be kind of uncomfortable and unfortunate. And people just despise that. They really hate it. They want us to do something about it. They just really don't understand that we're doing something about it by following the system, which means that we're also going to be able to profit from these big trends as well. Okay. I want to really start to wrap up. Rich, have a have a think about if you've got any closing questions. Um, I know Lisa's got dinner ready for Jerry. Um, early morning for us here, though. Uh, one last question from my side, Jerry. Um, again, just thinking of people who are wanting to fast track their journey to success as a CTA or a manager. Are there some pivotal moments in your path to success that uh, that you can recollect that you could pass on to others that might they could they might be able to learn from to fast track their journey yeah I saw that question on your list and I was hoping you would get to it I came up with a great answer because um, it's because <laughs> it's because it's my answer you know mm. do what Jerry did and that is um, Oh yeah, it's, there's probably no substitute for having a great mentor. So move to Australia, tell Rich that you will get his coffee every morning, sweep his, <laughs> sweep his yard, uh, mow his yard, sweep his front porch and beg him to be your mentor. <laughs> and, uh, now that's the first part. Find yeah. this mentor who loves trend following, who knows more than you know about it. Who can really? And I think uh, so, Jerry. <laughs> who, well, I'm talking about the masses out there, Rich. You're going to get a lot of resumes. <laughs> but then yeah. you, you also have to find the people. Rich needs to find uh, the person to invest in who's going to actually follow. And, you know, he's a smart person. He's skeptical. She is intuitive, ingenuitive and creative. But the bottom, bottom line is, They're willing to accept uh, the truths about these trend following, accept what the back tests and the numbers say and how the world works and actually follow and do what the mentor says. So you can have a great mentor, but it's up to you uh, to actually utilize it because so many people have, uh, you know, have not done that when they've had that opportunity. So, there's nothing that's going to fast track your life. You know, and my mistake was uh, when I left Chicago to move back to Richmond and sort of say, well, that was fun. I'm done. I know everything I need to know. I needed to go out and find another mentor. I needed to say, you know, I've got the trading down maybe, but I could use some help and some partners maybe, or I think stocks. Yes. So let's go to New York and let's get involved in a hedge fund somewhere where I hear, I learn about stocks. I know nothing about them. I know about futures and maybe my trend following ideas will get me a job and help uh, make the firm better. Uh, but it's almost this continuous thing where you always have to have great people around you. Uh, that was an, a ma- massive turtle mistake is that, uh, you know, all the famous guys at uh, AHL, those European CTAs, they went out as a group two, three, four people and started a firm and came from firms that were large. 
um, and had marketing and uh, compliance and legal and trading and research departments. And they were well versed on starting a corporation, a company. And we came out with trading rules and uh, wh- no, none of the turtles paired up and partnered up together. Huge mistake. Um, mm. So if you want to fast track, get with other smart people, like-minded, maybe you won't last your whole career and then more mentoring uh, to, uh, because I didn't know everything and I needed more training and more mentoring and smart people around me to keep me on the straight and narrow to some degree and not uh, get off track and learn more about stocks and, you know, securities. Cause that's a great thing about trend following no matter how the world changes in the future. Now we have crypto, which no one could have foreseen, but there'll be something else. There'll be another sector, another market that's wonderful and perfect and great to add to our portfolio. And trend following can knows how to handle whatever comes, comes our way in the future. Um, mm. So that, that's, yeah, that's my best advice. Go oh, I love that. Send, I, send I richer admit. resume. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In the post. Jerry, um, in, in relation to the mentoring, I, I get a lot of mentoring from you, as you know, and uh, this is where, you know, I'd encourage people to join us on Friday Spaces with Jerry, um, because if you are a regular participant over the weeks we've been doing it now, we've had many, many episodes now, Jerry, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the, the number, but when you participate week after week after week in these these episodes, um, this all of this knowledge from all of the different trend followers in the group there, it, it, it naturally consolidates and it really does help for the, the budding trend follower to participate in those sessions. So I'd be encouraging them all to join Jerry on the, on Friday um, with that Spaces session on Twitter. And I love the idea of collaborating with other traders too. I use the Discord application. I've got a bunch of, uh, you know, trading friends and colleagues that we can be always in touch, working on things together, researching together. Uh, so, yeah, I love the collaboration idea. My head of research and uh, head of trading has worked with me for both of them over right like right around 35 years. So that's pretty fun, pretty great. And um, we each have different roles within the group and we all kind of agree with each other or, but we do have disagreements. We do have arguments, <laughs> but, um, but still it's That's really it. the way to do it. But, um, you know, trading is fun. Trading is a business as well. And, um, the business part, I went to a good business school, but I got a little lazy and just thought, you know, the trading will bail me out. Maybe we're not good at client relations or marketing or sales, but the trading, and it doesn't, it doesn't always bail you out. You need to, you're going to go through these uh, periods where you really need to have strong, strong client relations and understanding and um, trend following, maybe plus a couple of other things. Maybe if you want to maximize your business, I'm not against that. I'm just saying it's too bad that um, most people prefer doing that rather than doing the hard thing and the right thing and the best thing possible. Um, maybe that's why trend following, like like the way we do it, is sort of destined to be a really um, not the biggest business on the planet by any means. But um, it's, it's our job, my job, and my commitment and my goal in life to keep it going and make sure as many people know how wonderful it is as possible. And I get a lot from those things too, Rich. I get a lot of Nice people telling me how much fun they have and how much uh, it means to them. It keeps them sane. And um, they're talking to everybody, talking to you. It's really, really, really helpful. It definitely is. Uh, what, how do I say it? I mean, I'm learning a lot from, from both of you guys, and, and it's very helpful. Let's just say that. And, Jerry, look, it was really great hanging out in, in Sydney the other week, and I'm so glad you had a good time down here. Can't wait to do it. We again. miss you already, yeah, Jerry. It's we'll time to it come back again. <laughs> it's good to hear. What uh, I can't wait to get back there and um, make make uh, Australia an annual event. However, however, you promised me you're going to come see me yeah. in New York. Yeah, yep. we'll come uh, that way. That's from the Yeah, that'd be really nice. <laughs> I'll come promise away. you we'll have a good time. Yeah, excellent. 
Yeah. All right. Anything else that I've missed, gentlemen, or shall we call it a wrap? Oh, there's so much more to talk about, but we should call it a wrap. <laughs> we'll do we'll it call again. That part two, because everyone's hungry. Yeah, yeah we'll two. definitely do it again. And yeah, happy to to do regular uh, updates and stuff, Jerry. So, Rich. Thanks very much, Simon. And no, I, I think we've covered a lot this session. It's, I always love having Jerry on. He is my mentor, as you, you've probably guessed. So, um, yeah, I lo love having him on here. Thank you. It's right. been a pleasure. I uh, really enjoy your time together as usual. Fantastic. All right. Thanks again, Jerry. Go have dinner, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you real soon. All right. Thank you. We should remind you that the conversations on this show are informal and for entertainment purposes only. Certainly any general advice you may hear is obviously not specific to your needs, goals or objectives. So nothing discussed on the show should be considered as investment advice. If you want that, you'll need to actually do your own research and speak with your financial advisor. Remember, trading can be extremely risky and past performance is not necessarily indicative of future returns. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe or leave us a review. And if you have any questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Bye for now.